Yes. Done. Um, I, I'm, I'm aiming to talk for a bit. That's fine. Good morning, everybody. People are slowly coming into the webinar. Welcome to this webinar on monitoring EOSC readiness for data policies. Great that you can make it. Thank you for being early. Morning, as you come in, if you'd like to put in the chat where you're from, which country, um, if you're windswept or not, if you're part of the storm or not, welcome everybody. Would be nice to know where you're coming from, where you're watching from this morning. UK, yes, it's indeed very windswept. Welcome Alison, one of our speakers. Thanks, Czech Republic. Mikael, welcome. Norway. Camden. I lived in Camden. I love Camden. London. Excellent. Andrew, welcome. Amsterdam. Not far from where I am. London, the UK. certainly is in the eye of the storm, the Netherlands. I'm feeling it myself. Oxford, sunny, surprisingly. <laughs> Paris, Paris, France, not Texas, pity. Maybe next year. Dublin, welcome, Natalie. Good to have you with us. <clears throat> France, Montpellier, probably sunny there too. Got a number of us from the Netherlands, the UK so far, Germany, oh, and Austria. Berlin, welcome. Brussels, sunny Brussels. Whenever I'm in Brussels, it's raining, but I know there is sun there. <laughs> Justina, you'll be talking to us later. Geneva, thank you. Raining, oh. The weather's always something we can talk about, isn't it? We're just gonna wait a couple of minutes because people are still are coming in. Oh, Italy. Welcome, Italy. So I think, have we still got people coming in? Madrid, Ingrid. The lady of fair is fair is with us too. Still people coming in. We'll get started in a second. I think we're pretty stable now. Yes, yeah, so um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Fair is Fair. My name is Vanessa Proudman. I'm director of Spark Europe. I'm really looking forward to this uh, next couple of hours. Um, I have to uh, give the credit for the, con the concept of this webinar goes to uh, Joy Davidson from uh, Digital Curation Centre, so thank you um, Joy. Uh, and we've also got uh, Trust IT helping us with the technology, so thank you very much uh, to them already up front. And thank you everybody for coming. Um, just uh, some practical things very briefly. Um, I think, as you know, the webinar is going to be recorded for those who can't make it. If you're not comfortable with that, now is the time for you to leave. Um, questions um, 
Regarding the format uh, today, we'd like you to put questions in the Q&A or in the chat. We'll be following those and we will give you the mic uh, if you put your hands up. Um, we're just doing that for security reasons due to some issues we had in previous uh, webinars. Um, so um, next slide, please. Um, so for those of you who don't know Fair is Fair, so Fair is Fair, this is one of the last events of the Fair is Fair project. I'm, I'm very honoured to have been part of this project. Um, it was a 36 month uh, EU project, is not was, but <laughs> uh, we are coming to the end of it um, at the end of this month um, with 22 partners from eight member states um, and you see the core partners um, here. And um, policy, policy monitoring and um, policy being a, a clear enabler um, uh, of uh, EOSC was really a, a critical part of the Fair is Fair project. Um, and it, we also felt that it was important to also um, discuss uh, policy monitoring and also some of the work that Fair is Fair has done, but also to catch up on where um, EOSC is with monitoring um, and others in this space um, as our policies become more mature, uh, more mature and how important it is um, uh, to monitor those. So welcome on behalf of Fair is Fair and Spark Europe. Uh, I'm the director of that. So um, before we get going, uh, next slide please. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so why is open science policy so important for the success of EOSC? Well, firstly, having an open science uh, policy in place, particularly a national one, it formalizes and publicizes a clear position and direction on open science to, to help us do good science, ensure transparency, and to progress open access to knowledge and stimulate its reuse. That's why it's so important. Um, and we're also trying to mainstream open science through this policy making and to help EOSC. That's why we are particularly here today. And what we are seeing is consistently over the years, we've been looking at this, there are more and more national funder and institutional policies uh, that address open science uh, and that are also prioritizing EOSC are also even including EOSC in their policies. Um, and with that uh, comes a further need to monitor some of those more mature policies to see how the implementation of those policies are going. Um, it was also the SRIA who, uh, who specified that national open science and fair data strategies were a key priority to enable the continuous monitoring of the landscape with regards to EOSC readiness. So hence the name of the session, monitoring EOSC readiness. Um, and when we are more aligned across Europe, which is so important uh, to support EOSC, um, we're setting a standard for a fair data framework together. So, I mean, EOSC has done a lot to help alignment across Europe and to, to um, develop the European policy roadmap. Um, it's got a lot of representatives from, a mem from the member states on its EOS steering board. Um, and also uh, Spark Europe, we've been facilitating the uh, Council for National Open Science Coordinators. And when interviewing those policymakers, uh, almost all of them have mentioned the importance of EOSC, um, supporting EOSC, implementing EOSC. So EOSC, EOSC has done a good job to be talking to the decision makers and to make sure that EOSC is part of their policy agenda. So, um, <clears throat> so but today, what we'd really like to talk about, it's how do we ensure that the policies that we have, have teeth? And what I mean with that is, so do they do what they set out to do, right? So to accelerate EOSC and embed this into, our member states research data practice, we need to monitor, um, monitor those policies um, and to see uh, what's been implemented so far, what are the struggles, to what extent 
have things been implemented and how are things being implemented? So what tools do we need uh, to do that? And we've got um, some um, good practices, some uh, ambitions around the table this morning. Uh, we're going to start that conversation. Um, particularly focusing on EOSC and of course, you know, open science policy monitoring is broader than EOSC, but EOSC is a critical part of that open science policy making uh, landscape. Um, so we're going to be talking about recent developments from the EOSC Association and the steering board, and then share details on initiatives that can support monitoring like um, uh, EOSC Future, Fair Sharing and Fair is Fair. Um, so that's a short um, introduction. Um, this is the program for uh, for uh, the lunch, the, the, the extended lunch time. Um, I've already touched on who we're going to be uh, uh, listening to. Um, and I think without um, further ado, uh, just to encourage you to put your questions in the chat or to raise your hands we'll be um, answering your questions to the speakers at the end of their sessions. Um, so I'd like to invite Ilaria and Justina. I think Justina is going to be giving us uh, the presentation. So Ilaria Nardello is the Senior Policy Officer um, at the EOSC Association. And we have Justina Kramacic, who's the Policy Officer, who will be telling us more about um, how to track progress across the EOS partnership. Um, so where are you with that challenge, Justina? And how are you going to support the EOS um, partnership going forward? I'm looking forward to your talk. It's over to you now, thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thank you for for invitation for for this great, uh, great event and for inviting us. We are really glad to be part of it. And we think that it's very important and timely initiative. Um, so I will start from the same beginning. And um, uh, today on behalf of the EOSC Association monitoring team, uh, I would like to say a few words about the EOSC partnership, um, about its objectives, the monitoring framework, as well as formal basis of the monitoring efforts. And furthermore, I will shed more light on our two major activities, monitoring key performance indicators and contribution to additional activities, mostly to the subject of the workshop in relation to fair data aspects. So let's begin with goals. As for the EOSC partnership uh, goal, general objectives set out by strategic research and innovation agenda, what we aim for is to help move the European research towards the open science paradigm by ensuring that open science practices, activities, and skills are rewarded and taught enough. And at the same time, they become a new normality. The EOSC partnership also is dedicated to ensure that data fairness uh, is possible by defining standards, policy frameworks, and by developing a number of tools and services. These tools and services uh, should be also available in sustainable and federated infrastructure uh, that enables open, share, uh, open sharing of research findings and data. And what is worthy to mention that these three objectives are complemented by nine specific and 14 operational objectives, which set scientific and technical targets to be achieved by 2030. So going further, I'm sorry. Um, based on this particular types of goals, we are obliged as an EOS partnership uh, to formulate a reference monitoring framework, allowing the progress to be tracked. If I may use any comparison, any metaphor, I would say that monitoring framework might be seen as a house, as a building, where these objectives are foundation of the framework. 
Then we have also the framework pillars that consist of set of measure of success or key performers indicators. In our case, we have 53 performers indicators. Also pillar of baseline, baseline and target, as well as standardized comparable methodology comprising data source, data provision, and data collection. Uh, all these pillars are closely tied to each listed specific and, uh, and uh, operational objective. What does monitoring framework serve for? Thanks to, thanks to the framework, we are able to provide a consistent approach to monitoring and evaluation of the EOS partnership so that um, sufficient data and information are captured to uh, review the progress and the impact of partnership. What is more, the monitoring framework help us inform subsequently all the partners involved, also EOSC uh, uh, future program, uh, EOSC future prog uh, pro project, and also EOSC steering board, and as well as to guide organization learning for the partnership improvement. It's good to bear in mind that the monitoring functions are integral to the effective operation of the partnership and increase the overall value derived from it. And maybe last thing, why I use this metaphor of house, because we see the monitoring framework as a living document. And like any other house, this framework can be rebuilt, repaired, repainted, redecorated or refined over the lifespan of the partnership to meet its needs and uh, obligations. So a need to set up a monitoring framework is expressed not only in SRIA, but also in memorandum of understanding between the, Europe, uh, the EOSC Association and European uh, Commission and European, uh, European Union in general. Um, the memorandum of understanding is a formal but not legally binding document uh, signed on 30 of July 2021, which can be seen as a formal date of the EOSC partnership establishment. According to MOU, EOSC Association is committed to measure the progress of the partnership based on KPIs. Uh, moreover, the association is expected to report on delivery of in-kind contribution to additional activities and investment in operational activities, and as well as to highlight impact case studies significant from the partnership point of view. So to meet all the requirements coming from SRIA and MOU, the association created a monitoring team last year and since November 2021. I have a huge pleasure to be part of this team and work together and learn, learn a lot from Ilaria Nardello, uh, who is senior policy officer in the association and she's together with us today. When it comes to um, first activity, uh, so when it comes to monitoring framework, a key performers, uh, performance indicators, mm, the first version of the framework hasn't been adopted yet. So we do our best to, um, to revise, to refine current draft published in summer 2021 and to reach the agreement on the first version in April. Basically, this revision uh, is focused, among others, on removing some obsolete uh, terminology, providing missing references, also refining methodology. And once this framework, the first version of the framework, uh, is agreed and approved by the partnership board, a full questionnaire or questionnaires addressed to different target groups uh, will be developed. So hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, in the spring and uh, maybe the questioner in the, in the autumn. In line with the draft um, framework, numerous fair aspects are planned to be followed, such as for policies, like the subject of the workshop, adoption of the fair principles, implementation of more technical for components and also human reports, uh, resources. And all of these aspects address 
gaps indicated in SRIA. So it means that they have been developed with the intention to fill these gaps. In terms of the fair policies, um, we would like to examine the data stewardship. So that is why we would like to see how many national education systems recognize European curricula for data stewardships. And we aim at five uh, educational system by 2025. Um, what is more, we intend to track the development and adoption of incentives for researchers to perform open science. So that's why the KPI uh, was developed, which says that percentage of research funding organization have policies in place to require data sharing and incentivize reuse. What is also of our interest is the increasing amount of fair research data produced by public funded research. So that's why we would like to take more attentive look to the percentage of EOSCA members who have fair policies implemented in project design via data management plans. Another aspect in terms of fairness it's adoption of the fair principles. And here, uh, what needs to be monitored is the increase of the number, uh, increase the number of relevant research results that are made available as open as possible. So in other terms, we would like to measure open access. We would like to measure percentage of publication from research performing organization in our association. Our a particular focus is also paid to the EOSC interoperability framework. Uh, and we would like to ensure that this framework is adopted by at least five major research infrastructure in Europe by 2023. We also pay attention to the number of uh, available fair assessment tool to measure the fairness and also number of available uh, frameworks to certify repositories. What we should keep in mind is that it's not only important to have a policies in place, not to adopt the fair principles, but also to implement technical components. And when it comes to this aspect, we would like to, um, we plan to uh, find out how technical components supporting for data, digital objects like standards, schemas, frameworks are specified by EOS correlated communities and if they are or how they are supported by the service providing organization. In our interest is also implementation of the EOS persistent identifier. And here we would like to also see if the persistent identifier allocation and using its adopted practice by research performing organization in our association. And last but not least, human resources. So people are significant in the whole process. So that's why, once again, we take a look on the data stewardship. And our intention is to uh, track the percentage of the research performing organization in our association who or which have data stewards to support their research. We also take a look on the mainstream open science skills in European research performing organization. That's why we would like to ask our members uh, who are the research performing organization if they offer training on open science and for data for researchers and at the, on the other hand for data stewards. And the last item is also research career assessment. So that's why one of our KPIs is the percentage of EOSC association members that recognize open science and fair activities in the research career assessments. In parallel, we are in charge of monitoring and reporting contribution to additional activities. What do the additional activities stand for? In short, uh, the, these activities are all in kind or cash EOSC member contributions that are in scope with the strategic research and innovation agenda. And what should be underlined, they're not covered by European Union funding, 
besides EC structural funds and recovery and resilience facility. These activities need to be monitored, reported, and presented in nine following categories given by the commission in the template which is identical for all horizon europe partnership so that's why for the sake of time i will just draw the attention to those activities which are eosc related and for example the category one which is support to additional rni and it encompasses all tierral levels also category five training and skills development needed for the workforce Category six, which is quite relevant, uh, and it concerns contributions to development of new standards and regulation and policies. Um, and the last one, uh, last column uh, with two categories quite relevant, supporting ecosystem development, focus on synergies, but also correlation interaction between national, international and institutional level. Uh, and last eight categories focus on the communication related activities, including also dissemination, awareness raising and citizen engagement. So how we monitor fairness via or through additional activities. Uh, for example, uh, in category one, we monitor deployment and we monitor contributions to the deployment of the online tools for verification. Category five includes education, training, and skills development in open science and fair data management, and also coordinating and aligning curricula on skills for fair and open science. So as you can see, they are quite similar to the KPIs developed in a draft monitoring framework. And of course, it has been done by purpose. Um, the category six, um, in the category six needs to be uh, monitored and verified the standardization and certification activities related to the EOS trust repositories. Also development of applicable fair guidelines and frameworks and standardization of persistent identifier uh, resource types. And the last category quite relevant in terms of monitoring framework uh, fairness it's monitoring of EOS key performance indicators and also data, uh, for data production and management. And what is more also contributions to, where, to rewards and recognition framework that incentivize for data and open science. That's why to, to grasp all this information, all these contributions to, um, to additional activities, we carried out the survey recently. So the survey, the survey was, uh, was conducted between 24th January and 11th February. Uh, it was conducted through online survey as a like GDPR compliant and user-friendly tool comprising three sections. The first section, general one, the second section on the monitoring additional activities 2022 and the last section only dedicated to the subset of mandated members on reporting on additional activities uh, 2021. And now we received, what can I say, what I could add is that we received a quite wide response. So we are happy because of this fact, but now we are in the process of analyzing of data and est establishing uh, additional activities plan for 2020. So from my side, uh, my and Ilaria, sir, because it's our joint effort, uh, it's, it's all and uh, that's all. And for any information, please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, and we look forward to your feedback and any comments. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank, thanks very much. Um, I, there are a couple of questions in the comments, um, so I can just Pose. There's two, one I think easier to answer than the other. So I'll give you the easy one first. Um, it was um, Hannah's team who asked um, when EOSC A members are mentioned in the presentation, does that also include observers? Yes, they are also included, but they are not included in all of the activities. For example, uh, in additional activities, we only include the uh, member. 
members of the association and mandated members. Okay, that's great. And the second one is a little bit more tricky. <laughs> so, so I'm very curious about something. So firstly, I really love that metaphor about the house. And it's a very strong Greek temple looking house. So <laughs> you really have thought thoroughly about, you know, the, the, the elements of open, open science and fair, right? And to build that house. So I think that's, that's great. Um, um, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, so just linking to what was just talked about, uh, you have this survey that's gone out. Um, of course, what's going to be important is to follow that progress. How much of that is going to be shared? So we're just talking about, well, what, what's, what's private, what's, we can't share everything. There is, there's certainly information in here probably that perhaps may be a bit more sensitive or where you would like to have more insights. Are you going to be sharing the data from the, the, the survey openly or to a large extent? Have you thought about that yet? I think that's what I'm curious about. Can the community follow the progress with you um, through okay. these extensive monitoring activities or, or is that still to be considered? I can respond um, if you, if you wish. Um, I think there will be always a reporting uh, from the commission. This is a public uh, partnership. And uh, certainly there will always be a reporting that is uh, made available through the commission on the data that are collected. Uh, of course, the data will often, I mean, always be in an anonymized form and aggregated most of the times. Um, however, um, there will be seminaries, and uh, of course, we will um, we will share the stories that we collect, and uh, this will this is meant to show, to show progress, to show the engagement of the community, to enlarge the basis of the membership, and um, certainly we have all the intention to to show how this ecosystem, how this landscape develops and and evolves. Certainly. And Great. Looking I mean, even the opportunity that you gave us today, we are um, we don't have anything to show because our survey has just closed. But yes. these are all avenues where the information can be made available and shared. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I'd like to now move to the next speaker. He's already been mentioned in the previous uh, uh, question and answer session, Volker Beckmann um, from the EOS Steering Board. He's the coordinator of EOSC in France at the French Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation. Um, Volker, you're gonna be talking to us about monitoring EOSC readiness on a national level. Some of those challenges, having a single monitoring system um, looking at how to st stock progress, also the financial commitments um, made to EOSC and sharing good practices, I believe. Um, looking forward to hearing more. It's over to you, Volker. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, the slides are visible. Yes, thank you. And thanks for in the invitation, the, the introduction. I'm very Honor to, to be able here to talk about what we have in mind at the EOS steering board in terms of monitoring of EOS readiness. So I will give you a short answer to why yet another survey. Uh, I will explain uh, in which context we, we see the EOS steering board survey there. And we'll go very briefly through the, through the set of questions we are going to ask this year. Um, then uh, I will say, a word about the status of the EOS steering board survey. I guess also uh, Gareth is going to uh, mention uh, something about that in the following presentation. So why yet another monitoring? So we are, we are kind of swamped in Europe with landscape analysis and monitoring efforts. And so the question is relevant. Why do we, do we add another uh, brick to this house in this context? Um, in general, I mean, transitions like making open science the new normal need, need a lot of investment, investment in money, but investment in res, uh, human resources, uh, investment in, in engagement. So we, we are talking about the participation by a large number of stakeholders, the colleagues in the labs, at universities, research organizations, their, their managements and infrastructures, governments, and also at the European level, the commission. 
So we need a certain level of coordination there. Um, and in order to have this coordination, we think that national policies are a very important frame in this context because they give orientation to the research performing and research funding organizations. And they should also, ideally, they should influence the investment decisions which we are taking at national and regional level in the different countries. So they have, should have a direct impact in how much uh, financing and then uh, eventually how much human resources are put into place to make open science the new normal. So we, we discussed already a bit about this. So, so we have this uh, EOS steering board. You heard about this now. The EOS is one of the 12 uh, co-program partnerships in Horizon Europe. We have the three partners, the commission, the EOS association, and we, we saw the presentation uh, just a moment ago. And we have the member states and the associated countries. These are about 35 countries in total, which are represented in, uh, in the EOS steering board, which is uh, co-chaired uh, with, the, with the European Commission. So there's, there's a strong commitment in this partnership. You saw this uh, from the EOS association side who provide the, the services of the EOS and represent the service providers and the users there with the European Commission with a commitment of nearly half a billion euro uh, within Horizon Europe. And we have the member state and the states and the associated countries which support the EOS through policy development, through financing of EOS relevant infrastructures and organizations, and which help also with the coordination of activities at the European level. So why another monitoring? So surveys are often patchy. So you have difficulty to achieve a complete thematic or geographical or in other terms, uh, coverage. And if we talk about the survey, uh, it's, it's, it's very often, it's a one-time shot. So we had this very valuable uh, EOSC uh, landscape survey, which was published in 2020, and which is, it's a great resource if you look what is going on in the different countries. It's of limited use when you want to study evolution. So you have to have a monitoring in place and surveys very often produce results which are not necessarily machine readable. So if you want to do, really do a monitoring, you should produce something which is quantitative also and which you can analyze uh, in, a, in, a, in a quantitative way. So another advantage when we talk about the EOS steering board survey is that we have a single point of entry to all countries because we have one member who is uh, assigned from, from each country in the steering board. So we can talk directly to a country through this, this colleague. And uh, there's a reliable, accountable answer at the national level we are, we are going to receive. And there's a very high motivation by the EOSC steering board to, to respond to the survey and to demonstrate commitment to the EOSC. So there, there's the MOU between the commission and the association where the monitoring was kind of one of the things which had to be signed the steering board decided on its own that this is a good idea to have this national monitoring. Uh, so we deliberately do that. And uh, so the, the motivation, the commitment, I think is very high among the, the members of the EOS steering board. So now focusing on this, the survey itself. So as I said, the, we, we as representatives of, of governments, we, we, we support the EOS through policy development, financing of EOS relevant infrastructures and organizations, and we help with the coordination of activities. If you want to put this in short for the monitoring, it's about policies, it's about financing, which results from these policies. So there's motivation for this monitoring. It's also to share our best practices, to learn from each other, what works in one country, can it be perhaps also applied in other countries? Uh, we would very much like to have an overview of the actual investment into the EOS. And we would through this like to demonstrate the commitment uh, to the EOS providers, because in the EOS association, you have a large number of organizations to say, well, we do our share. So where's the share of the, of the, of the governments in the different countries? And we want to demonstrate that this uh, share is actually there and that it's evolving, hopefully in a, in a positive way, 
and we want to demonstrate this for the for the monitoring and this also should reflect back on us we should this should motivate us as countries to do better and more for the EOSC so the, when we when we start thinking about the EOSC steering board survey of course there are a lot of areas uh, you can think of open access to publication uh, research data management infrastructures and the EOSC citizen science for example uh, incentives and rewards and skills so all these aspects we need when we want to monitor uh, open science to reach this point as uh, becoming the new normal by the end of uh, horizon europe so we cannot of course not start with everything at the same time so we said okay where do we want to focus on let's focus on the policies and the practices on research data management infrastructures and the eosc at the national level the impact part you saw a lot of this in the monitoring of the eos association so this we see is very much taken uh, care of there um, of course the association has also uh, monitoring on the practices so there's a certain overlap and in the next steps of our monitoring we will have to discuss closely as we did before with the association to make sure that there's not too much overlap and that we don't ask the same questions twice so if we want to reach open science as the new normal it's clear that we need additional partners it cannot be only the EOS steering board we need the EOS association you saw this what they have in mind to to monitor we need for example the era with their high level uh, EOS readiness KPIs we need the NPRs uh, um, who, who, who have a list of questions that they answer and we have in, here it's in the center the EOS steering board with the national investments and the policy development and all of this should then be monitored in the EOS observatory and you will hear Gareth's presentation just afterwards um, so there's a the question what to monitor so we had a the discussion with the different partners of the EOS not only the EOS steering board uh, then it's necessary to align this so we did this in the, in the last year that we discussed with the association and other partners what are we going to ask what are you going to ask um, to avoid this uh, duplication and then the implementation of different monitoring levels in the EOS observatory and later on this is then the next step the alignment with general open science monitoring so the question is how to monitor so we had some uh, uh, um, proof of concept work last year uh, and this was very successful I think it showed what things work where, where the problems are with certain questions and in, in, the, in the questions on how to, to um, display the, the results then and then uh, EOS Future develops the EOS Observatory and once finalized this is the long-term goal uh, this still has to be uh, uh, yeah, this still has to be discussed, but in principle, the idea I think is that the EOS Association at one point takes over the EOSC Observatory in the future. This is a bit something we, we can discuss in, in, in the future because first we have to get the observatory rolling and we rely very heavily on EOS future. Yeah. So what questions do we ask the, oops, this year? Um, so we start with very general questions. So are there EOS relevant policies in place at national or regional level? And then there's a multiple choice with different aspects like fair data or EOSC, et cetera. Um, do the EOS relevant policies in place include measures to ensure implementation? Because we don't want, we want to have the policies. We also want to have action plans, concrete objectives, indicators to monitor or associated financial planning. Then, the third question is, are the financial contribution to the EOS at national level linked to these policies? So there we hope this is also to motivate, right? We want to see this link between investment and policies in the countries. And that's a crucial question, the total amount of national EOS contributions spent. We start with 2020 because we first, we thought we would ask the question a bit earlier in the year, but uh, we keep it now like this. So we ask first for 2020 and the goal is not to to make a ranking then which country uh, is doing best and which is so we want to have as a first measure a total overview how much is invested and if it's not as high as we would wish for then we can do better in the next year so it's not that uh, colleagues should be afraid in the different countries saying oh 
I don't want to report this because I think it's it's not enough. Uh, I link also in the in the slides then which you will have access to the, the, the survey document so that you can look at what we explain at, uh, the different uh, questions and what our the, the background ideas are. So then so we have this question how much did you did you invest in 2020 and then we ask how much goes to EOS association members and how much did go to, to uh, member, uh, organizations which are not in the EOS association to see how, um, uh, how well does the association uh, map our investment uh, into the EOS. Then how did you estimate this? Um, um, what kind of in, uh, contributions did you include? And then the question if this was, it's, if it's really labeled EOS or open science, or if you consider this is just, uh, uh, it's a general investment and so and so much percent of this is used for EOS relevant activities. So this is, this is a bit all questions around uh, the, the financial contributions and where it went to. So for example, also here down, down there, then what kind of aspects of the EOS were financed through this investment. So and then at the end, we, we have some, some questions about whether, whether there is already a mandated organization. So this is also to monitor that we want to build up the, the EOS association and we want to have the mandated organizations in place. Um, and that's for being able to also to harvest what is already done. Is there already uh, monitoring in place in your country? Because we might use these values, we can integrate this directly then in the, in the observatory if already something is done. We don't want to duplicate work. We want to use what is already done in terms of monitoring. And we afterwards, we want to share this with other monitoring exercises who might want to use this, this, uh, this information. And finally, we want to share um, best practices. So if there is, if a country wants to uh, demonstrate, we have a great uh, use case uh, where we show how we we uh, we contribute to the EOS, then please feel free to to describe that. So, what is the status of this uh, the survey? We have the questions finalized. You can find find them in the EOS Association newsletter. Um, there were some technical and legal issues with rolling out the survey. Um, meanwhile, the the steering board members they prepare their answers because they can also take the twenty questions on paper and, and answer them like this. And then once the, the survey page uh, is open, probably later this month, then they, they can fill this in. And we hope that we have first results end of March. If this is then April, it's also fine. So we aim at first results presentation at the EOS policies event in Strasbourg uh, in early May. So what is in for you? Why, why might this be interesting for you? Um, I, I think this, this monitoring at national level, this, this uh, is a good approach because it, it aims at completeness and reliability of results because you have directly the, the, the ministries involved there who want to make sure that their, their information is, is accurate and that it's complete. Um, we want to produce machine readable results made public for the, the EOS observatory dashboard and again, uh, Gareth is going to tell you all about that in the next presentation. And the good thing about this monitoring as, uh, approach is we, we do this modular. So we have a short list of questions for this year to start with. Next year, we want to increase this by other aspects of open science. Um, but we are going to still ask the questions we, we had in this year's monitoring in order to see the evolution there. And it's a collaborative work. So we work closely together with the ERA, with the NPR, with uh, the Open Science uh, Unit in, in DGRTD, with the EOS Association. And uh, so we are also very open for collaboration there. So we, we gathered also comments on the questions. We know that one can always do better. So we, we hope that we improve over the years how we ask the questions and uh, how, we, how we address the different points of open science. So we really want to create one framework to monitor the way towards open science as the new normal. So just as a summary, um, I think it's, it's important to have this coordinated approach with all the 
partners in EOS and with partners in open science in general. We want to create something which is con complete, reliable, and accessible. So the results should at one point be openly accessible. Of course, we have to work with the, the different countries to see with what they are comfortable to, to publish. And first results of this survey we expect uh, this spring, and you will have access to the survey document either through the presentation or through the newsletter in December on this number six newsletter of the EOS Association. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Volker. Do we have any questions from the audience, either in the chat or you can raise your hand? We can give you the mic. We, we don't have anything yet. I, I put one in the chat, actually, just um, for Volker. I was curious when you were talking about the investments um, and the questions around reporting on investment, do you provide any guidance to people on, on how they should um, report on the in-kind contributions? Because I know that can be really difficult to do in a standard way. So I was just wondering if there's any sort of um, advice that you could give to us, if that is something that we would be looking to report. So on the national level, we don't look for in-kind contributions because okay. we think that this is the part where the EOS Association comes in and reports. We are aware that not everybody is in the EOS Association, but that should be our goal. If we would allow also to report in-kind contributions, then it would get very, there would be so much overlap with what is reported by the association that it wouldn't be very instructive, I think. I can elaborate a little bit on uh, um, the methodology we are adopting in this respect as the association. Um, in our um, survey of the additional activities, um, we ask um, to report um, in-kind contributions as per our memorandum of understanding with the European Union. And these in-kind contributions are um, suggested to be given in uh, terms of full-time equivalent. Uh, so you can report um, the amount of personnel that works on a certain activities, on a certain activity. And uh, we also advise um, to convert that number, so number of FTEs, with an equivalent in monetary terms of 100,000 euro. We are perfectly aware that one full-time equivalent uh, personnel may not cost or more or less than 100,000 euro. However, for... Um, for allowing us to calculate how much of the total contribution in monetary terms comes from full-time equivalent from personnel, uh, human resources use, uh, and how much comes from other forms of investment, uh, we suggest to use this conversion factor, one FTE, 100,000 uh, euro. Um, we're in discussion with the commission whether this is suitable um, conversion factor or not. We know it's not perfect, but it's just uh, a convention, in fact, and uh, it does not uh, um, take anything away from the real cost of uh, service of human capital uh, in any country. And Michelle has just come in with some further comments. That's great. Thanks very much. I see in the chat. Yes, I, I wasn't clear on my slide. I, I wrote partnerships. It's one of the 12 co-program partnerships. So they're co-program and co-finance partnerships. Thanks, Michelle, for, for clarifying this. So there, there are a couple of additional questions if we have just a, two more minutes in the, the questions now. Um, one is from uh, Nathina, Nath Nanitha, sorry, Charlotte Dagslot. Um, how do you deal with double reporting on national finance, financial contributions uh, in the EOS steering board survey and financial contributions for members of the EOS association reported in, in the AAP survey? So we, we look at national investment, right? If you have a program, open science, uh, how much we invest on the national level into that. Then the, it's clear that there will be some overlap with what is reported by the EOS Association because we finance 
uh, and then this is used by the research performing organizations in order to to uh, to execute uh, activities in order to put um, personnel into place. So there, there there is a bit of overlap, but I don't think this is harmful. I, I think this will just show that what we invest on the national level actually arrives in human resources and in-kind contribution investment of the research performing organizations. Ilaria, would you like to respond to you? Yes. Yes, I can. Uh, I think perhaps in, in a very ideal world, <laughs> the, the sums reported uh, on one side should equate in fact the 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 other you know the part that comes from the um from the additional activity uh, reporting um however um certainly in the um in the eosca association surveys we may not be able to cover the full national scene uh, as not all the organizations uh, of a country are part of the um, association, at least uh, there may be, maybe we may have a case or two, but uh, uh, this is not the typical situation. So more likely what is reported at the um, country level through the steering board survey is going to be more representative of the, of the national effort than the, what is reported by the association is what the research performing organizations, perhaps some private partners and, um, and the funders uh, that are members of the association uh, can actually report. Um, as Justina was mentioning earlier, um, and as per a question that was put earlier uh, in the chat, the members that are surveyed in the association survey is, um, is just a, a portion or just a portion of a total uh, number of representatives that may be part of the evolution of this landscape. So we may be underrepresenting, and perhaps the steering board survey will, will give us a fuller figure. Although less, less broken down. Thank you very much. I know I'm supposed to be the chair of this, but I can't see anybody else beyond the panel. So if you have your hands up, can you perhaps put it in the chat or other colleagues help me out here whilst I, we solve that think, technical issue? Or maybe it's yeah, because of screen sharing or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we've we've covered everything in the in the chat. Excellent, the perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I'd like to move us over to um, talking about the EOS Future Dashboard. I'm really looking forward to hearing about that. It's Gareth O'Neill, who's the Principal Consultant of Open Science at the Technopolis Group, I think known to most of us. Um, I'm sure this is going to be an enlightening presentation. Um, Gareth, there are lots of plans. Where are you with them? <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. I check if you can see uh, the screen in front of you. Yes. Perfect. Um, then I'm going to talk about the uh, the EOSC Observatory uh, today, which brings some of the uh, discussions that we've had with Volker, Larry, and Justina together uh, in terms of the monitoring and reporting. Uh, and this is a, a basically a policy intelligence tool uh, that we're developing in the EOSC Future Project uh, with Open Air. So this is Technopolis Group and Open Air working together on this. Um, now, for those of you who don't know, the EOS Future Project. Uh, that is a response to the Infra EOSC O3 2020 call uh, that had the title of integration and consolidation of the existing pan European access mechanism to public research infrastructures and commercial services to the EOSC portal. Uh, in a nutshell, EOSC Future will basically create uh, an operational EOSC core, an EOSC exchange facilitated by an EOSC interoperability framework. It will onboard services from uh, the scientific cluster communities as well as data and also services from the Infrius 07 projects, which are partnered with this project uh, call. Um, and ultimately it will work uh, very closely, let's say on a strategic level with key stakeholders uh, and also with the EOS community and especially through what we have called an EOS user group of representatives from the community. Um, now this strategic alignment uh, works on many levels. 
So two of our key uh, partners, as you will have guessed, are the EOSC Association uh, involved in the EOSC partnership and also the EOSC steering board also involved in the EOSC partnership. And we're trying to align uh, together on, on many different levels. One of them is in the reporting and you'll hear about the observatory in a moment. We're also aligning with multiple projects. You'll hear about that in a bit as well. We're aligning with the Infosco 7 projects, uh, which are providing services for the uh, for EOS for the EOS portal. And we're also aligning with the Infosc 05 projects. So uh, these are the, the, the projects that have come, let's say, before EOS Future, and we're building upon that. You'll hear about that in a moment as well. And further to that, we're working with uh, multiple strategic initiatives, such as Euro HPC, even more specifically, such as with the Phoenix infrastructure. Uh, with Gaia X, who's also building a cloud infrastructure, particularly aimed at industry, and with the coming data spaces, uh, the common data spaces from the European Commission. So that's just a snapshot of all the different stakeholders uh, that we're working with and trying to strategically align with. Um, now, for this observatory, um, basically, it's 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 a, an online dashboard, an interactive dashboard. There's a front end and a back end. Uh, the front end is for the public to access the data that we'll be collecting and to use different tools uh, to visualize and compare this data. So for tracking policies, infrastructures, data services, all linked to EOSC. Uh, and on the back end, we will be collecting uh, data from multiple uh, sources. I'll come back to that. Two of those key sources are the EOSC Association and the EOSC uh, Steering Board. And the intention is that that data is collected on the back end, uh, that the data then will be uh, validated, selected, and then ultimately presented publicly through the front end of the, uh, the dashboard of the observatory. And a key idea here is that this supports uh, the overall monitoring, let's say, of EOSC, uh, and then more specifically supports the EOSC partnership and the activities of the EOSC Association and the EOSC steering board. And this doesn't come from uh, uh, scratch. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's come uh, before us to build upon this. We've been working with uh, uh, many of the uh, InfoEOSC 05 projects, including Ferris Fair. And the idea here uh, is uh, to build on some of the work they've been doing on the indicators to monitor EOS readiness. Um, and they've done that through a communal task force, the task force landscaping, uh, and also to uh, take the work that they've done. So they developed a prototype dashboard uh, for uh, monitoring readiness, and we're trying to learn from this dashboard as well and implement it. So uh, we've been building on the projects that are there and we're working closely together with them. Now, I'm going to take some time to explain this, this dartboard that you see in front of you here. Uh, and this is essentially the core of what the uh, EOSC Observatory will do and what it will uh, uh, present to an extent. So what we have are what we call these four different layers uh, of, of, let's say, monitoring activities. Uh, the first layer, this yellow core in the center, number one, is for monitoring uh, EOS readiness and specifically looking at the indicators and questions for monitoring EOS readiness at national level. So this links back to uh, the presentation by Volker and the discussion of the survey uh, where we would be trying to incorporate uh, questions and responses from uh, the national survey, which in my understanding will be a yearly survey, and then present that through uh, the observatory. So it's twofold. On the one hand, it's to collect the data on the, on the back end, let's say, uh, through survey forms and to help with the um, analysis and visualization and ultimately uh, validation of that data. And then uh, at a later point to put that data out in a, let's say, user-friendly way through the observatory so that people can interact with that data. On the second layer, and this is this, this I don't know what color that is, salmon color. Uh, we'll be looking at the indicators to monitor the EOS partnership. This ties back to what Ilaria and Justina were talking about with the monitoring uh, of, uh, of the EOS partnership. Here we're specifically talking about the KPIs for tracking the progress of EOSC. Uh, that will be released through a survey uh, by the EOSC Association. Again, I've understood that will be a yearly survey. Um, and the idea there is to help with the collection of that data. Again, the analysis, visualization of that data and then ultimately to help with the reporting on that data and to present validated, selected data publicly through uh, the EOSC Observatory. In a similar uh, line of thinking, we have a third layer also related to the EOSC Association activities, and this is for monitoring the contributions to the EOSC partnership. And the idea here is that the association uh, will report to uh, the European Commission through what's called the Additional uh, Activities Plan, on the different activities that are going on by the members of the EOSC Association. 
and also the financial estimates, as Hilary explained, um, and that this tool will help that on the back end again to collect data, uh, to sort data, and let's say process that data, and then after validation and selection to present uh, key data again through the observatory and the public. Uh, now the fourth final layer is a bit of a broader uh, uh, focus, let's say this is for tracking other policies related or relevant for the EOSC ecosystem. Uh, here we're thinking of policies, other policies, let's say at a national level through other uh, structures or initiatives working on open science, possibly even uh, policies that are relevant for EOS coming from different institutions. So the overview here is that we are trying to build uh, an observatory to bring together all the different monitoring activities uh, related to the policies on open science in EOSC uh, to collect that in one more centralized tool and then to be able to look across layers and compare and then ultimately present that so that uh, members of the EOS community can see what's going on uh, in, for instance, particular countries or in the EOS partnership uh, or in other uh, policies relevant for EOSC and to compare and to also help uh, the EOS partnership with the reporting. So that's that's more or less the overview, let's say, of the observatory. Uh, methodologically, I've, I guess I've explained that a little bit, but the idea here is to, first of all, uh, to help with this reporting, to try and collect data from automatic sources. So trusted sources, we try to automatically collect data and filter it into uh, the EOSC observatory. In this sense, we're thinking of uh, statistics coming from, for instance, the Open Science Observatory uh, by Open Air, which, for instance, tracks open access publications, open data sets, open software sets. Uh, and we're also looking at seeing how to incorporate statistics from the EOS portal, uh, such as the data sets and the services and the usage uh, in the portal and across the different infrastructures linked up to EOS there. Uh, this is the automatic data collection. There's also then uh, the manual data collection, which we refer to. So these are the service uh, surveys, uh, which will be run by the EOSC Association and the EOS Steering Board. Uh, and we'll, we will collect the data then through this tool and help the representatives of these uh, organizations and member states uh, to, to bring their data together and to compare and analyze, analyze, and analyze it. Um, then the next step here would be for the selection and the validation of the data, uh, which needs to be done by, by the representatives themselves. And then the final uh, step, let's say, in this process is the sharing and the presentation of this data online uh, on the uh, front end or the public website of the observatory. Uh, and uh, uh, gradually over, let's say, the course of the EOS Future Project will start developing uh, the functionalities and improving the user uh, experience for this. So right now, if you go to the EOS portal, you'll find uh, the EOS Observatory webpage, but there's just a very simple landing page there now for the moment with some inf information. And as the data is collected and comes in and is made available, that will start appearing on the webpage. And then as we start developing more functionalities, there'll be more, let's say, user interfaces uh, to access and exploit that data. Uh, I won't go into the architecture too much, it's just to say that uh, on the back end of this, that this uh, observatory consists of a survey tool, uh, which will be used to collect the data and archive the data and interact with the data uh, for the representatives filling in the surveys. Uh, it will also be feeding into the monitors that we have, such as the EOS portal and the Open Air Open Science Observatory, and that this will be helping these representatives in their own reporting, and then also, let's say, in this public reporting, uh, presenting this data to uh, the community. Uh, the timeline for this is over the duration of the EOS Future Project. Uh, we've already gone through the uh, landscape analysis and a lot of the discussions that we've had together on how to align uh, the different monitoring activities in EOSC uh, and also how to build a tool that is, let's say, fit for purpose for these different types of uh, monitoring activities and how to present that. We're now in uh, Q1 of 2022, so we're now further developing the dashboard. And as we go, uh, we'll go through different rounds of testing and different rounds of implementing uh, newer functionalities. The testing itself has actually already happened um, and will continue on this year uh, as we start expanding the scope of the observatory and the data coming in. And then the idea is to publicly roll this out in Q1 2023 and to further to develop that until the end uh, of the EOS Future project. I'm not sure if the time, Vanessa, uh, if I'm on or not, but I think I'll stop there and I'll see if there's any questions. We've got plenty of time. You're doing well, thank you. Thank you very much, Gareth. Are there any questions? No, I don't see anything in the chat yet, but if people want to add questions, feel free to put it into the chat or raise your hands and we can 
uh, unmute you and let you ask your question live. I think I have a question. <clears throat> so this is like a really critical technical arm for the EOSC Association and Steering Board um, activity, monitoring activities. And, you know, and you're also going to give some of that data back to the community through that validation and selection of data and presenting it, visualizing it. Um, so I think that's going to be a really valuable tool. Um, the outer circle, I think you showed, um, uh, went beyond that. Uh, perhaps it was on a higher level to share information on policy. So I think the other levels were more um, the, the detailed level of questions from you know, the different monitoring indicators across the association and the steering board. Did I understand it right that you're also wanting to collect information on the national open science policies? Exactly. So the this so basically the, the first three levels are are fine-tuned to the uh, the needs, let's say, of the EOSC Association and the EOS Steering Board and the questions uh, that they want to ask and need to ask uh, mm -hmm. at both the national level and also uh, at the organizational level for the EOSC Association. And this 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 other layer is for capture, capturing all these other policies linked to open science and EOSC, such as, for instance, national policies. You could be thinking of national policies on open access. Uh, you could be thinking of specific fair data policies, data stewardship policies, I guess, um, possibly even citizen science policies. I think on this fourth layer, it's a bit more comprehensive and could include you know, other activities linked to all the different practices of open science. So uh, I think the idea here really is to try and capture uh, I won't say the full picture, I don't think that's possible, but as comprehensive a picture as possible of the open science and EOSC landscape uh, across Europe. Um, and, and I say across Europe, it's possible that extends at some point beyond Europe if there's relevant or linked policies, but certainly starting with Europe. Okay, thank you very much. So we do have a couple of questions now that have come into the, the chat. Um, the first one is from the fourth outer layer. Uh, in your diagram, the policy is relevant to the EOS. Will you collect data on national legislations as either enabling or hindering implementation of EOS? I checked this was on the fourth layer, so I guess this is not the layer directly linked to the EOSC Association and the EOSC uh, Steering Board, right? Yeah, it's the fourth outer layer. Um, I, I could envision that, yes, this, this, this could be included. Um, I mean, we're, we're at the moment focusing on uh, for, for priority reasons, we've been focusing on tailoring uh, the, the observatory towards the needs of the ESC Association and the EO Steering Board. And I think we've now reached the stage where we're looking at what to start with uh, for this fourth layer, um, what types of policies and, and who to target to start collecting those policies. So I think definitely national legislations would be one of them um, that would be very relevant and interesting here. So yes. I, th I think, Volker, did you have something to add to that? Or Yes, for example, in the steering board questions, we, we use the term policy in a very wide sense. So if a country has a law in place that says, well, all publicly funded uh, research has to open openly distribute the data afterwards, that's, that's counted as a policy and can be mentioned in the, in the monitoring. Can I also ask another final question? So I'm curious about that fourth uh, ring. So we, we've heard from the other uh, presentations, there is, there is a lot to potentially monitor, uh, a lot of interesting information that will come out from all of the, uh, that. The fourth layer is also quite a huge one and an ambitious one. And if you think about it, there are, there are lots of players who are already monitoring parts of that landscape. Um, how come you took that also upon yourselves to, to want to bring that all together in there as well as the things specific to EOSC? So uh, I guess there's, there's many disparate, mon mo disparate monitoring activities, uh, as you can see, right in Open Science yeah. and EOSC. And the idea here was to try and bring a lot of those monitoring activities and, and data together as much as possible uh, so you can you know easily uh, find the relevant data that you're looking for um, uh, and I think that uh, you know because like I said we need to first prioritize um, across the different layers and then this fourth layer 
um, I could see that we start small and then gradually start expanding out on the different types of policies uh, that would be that would, we would be collecting. Obviously, also, first of all, to try and avoid overlap, uh, but also to, in a way, to prevent overlap. So this comes back a little bit to the question on how to separate, for instance, things like double reporting and so forth. Uh, our common goal, I think, and, and uh, uh, Ilaria, Justina, and, and Fulker can can fill this in. But I think our common goal here as well uh, was to try and align a lot of these activities and a lot of the reporting activities uh, to see where there are overlaps, and then to start avoiding overlaps or to neatly put those overlaps together and try to fill in gaps across layers and to help each other in the monitoring. So I think that was the overall. Uh, let's say, a uh, big view. This ties a little bit to the comment that's just come in there from Dari as well. I see it says an infrastructure-oriented question. How do you see the relationship between the OS Observatory uh, and the Open Air Research Graph? So um, this is, just to be clear here, this is the EOSC Observatory. The relationship this would have with the Open Air Open Science Observatory is relatively clear for us. Uh, where, where possible, we would be uh, uh, linking to the data from the Open air, open air, open science observatory to help the representatives of uh, EOSC Association and EOSC Steering Board and others filling in the surveys uh, and helping them, uh, you know, get uh, easier access to the data coming in from their in their own reporting. So uh, we see a, li a direct link there from that observatory to the EOSC observatory uh, to help with our own data collection. Same, I would see for the open air research graph. Um, this links, I guess, a little bit back to the, also what I said about linking uh, where possible to statistics coming from the EOS portal. Um, and I say EOS portals, knowing that the EOS portal, let's say, is, is not the only portal. There's a whole variety of this different disciplinary uh, community portals out there, I guess, that we could link to, um, not just through the EOS portal directly, but also possibly directly to these other portals. So uh, I think it remains to be seen. And we need to discuss exactly what we will be linking to um, and not just to link uh, to these uh, other observatories for linking sake, but to actually get the correct data coming into the observatory to help uh, our, our individuals filling in the surveys and then to see if it makes sense to present some of that data as well through the observatory, if that helps. Great, thank you. So I think we're actually in perfect timing for our next speaker. Thank you very much, Gareth. I'd like to invite um, Alison Lister um, who from Fair Sharing, uh, who is the content and community coordinator. Now you have been doing work on um, uh, monitoring um, open science policies. Um, and you're going to tell us, um, you're going to give us an update on the registry um, looking forward to hearing more from you, um, Alison, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see the slides? Just the traditional beginning yes. of any conversation and presentation. Thank you very much. I also want to say thank you to Joy for sharing her presentation time with us today. I am the content and community coordinator with Fair Sharing, and I'm going to cover what we do with policies and what we do for policies and how it relates to what we're covering in today's webinar. I want to start by giving a very short overview of what fair sharing is. Now we store three main types of descriptions of resources. We store information about standards, databases, and data policies. And not just that, but we store the relationships that link those and provide a whole ecosystem of how each of these resources interrelate. We are a curated resource and we provide community vetted content that gives insight into how things like the standards are used in practice by databases and aligned with data policies. And this makes us a trusted source for these relationships among standards and databases and therefore shows adoption and implementation of standards by policies or standards by databases, it goes across the whole relationship, the whole ecosystem here and across research areas. We are a research uh, sort of subject agnostic resource that provides information from all across any research area. We are a part of EOSC and we are part of the broader research ecosystem. We have a large number of users, adopters and communities that work with us 
in making sure that their resources are richly described and discoverable and accessible by their communities. And there's a whole list here, but I wanted to just give you a general idea that we have a variety of stakeholders across a number of uh, research associations, working groups, uh, stakeholder groups, and funder funders and publishers. What do we do in fair sharing, really? How much information do we have? Well, we have over 3,500 resources registered in fair sharing. Most of these are standards and repositories. And this slide shows you a little bit about the different types of resources that we have within these registries. And what I really wanted to focus on with you guys was how we can show implementation of these resources in practice because we work with the community to help have them describe how their resources are used, how their standards are implemented, how their what what standards are used by which databases. So I want to start with a little bit of an example of our data policies. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but what I want you to take away from this is that we store a variety of structured metadata around data policies. Now, this one is an example of a data policy from a funder from Wellcome Trust. And what we can do through the structured metadata is provide both a human accessible and machine readable version of the metadata that's important to the user community. And this helps with uh, monitoring use and adoption of the policy itself and the standards and databases that rec are recommended by that policy. So this first screenshot is the general information on a policy record. It provides descriptions, the countries that develop this resource. I do know that in one of Volker's slides, it talked about, are there any EOSC relevant policies in place at a national or regional level? Well, you can take a slice of our policy data or indeed any of our registry information based on country or any other information that you can see here. Another thing we can show within the policy record is the relationships, those relationships I really mentioned earlier in the talk that show which standards are shown are, are implemented by which databases. And in this case, those policies, which are themselves uh, recommended or extend the policy that we're looking at, also any databases or standards that are recommended by the Wellcome Trust policy. I will show you a graphical view of this very shortly, and we'll go into a little bit more of why this is relevant. But just to note as well on this slide that we have a lot of extra metadata really useful for our users, such as documentation, social media, and organizations that are related to the policy. So every record in fair sharing has the ability to display its graph of relationships, its network, its ecosystem, and how and how it's used and adopted. And this can change over time. And we provide a lot of information to help sort of monitor the changes in these resources over time. Not only do we have a maturity status for every record, and in this graph, it's shown in the color of the nodes in the graph. So all of those green nodes are shown as ready. And it will also show you uh, how these relationships are created, what type of relationship there are. So if we look first at the two triangles at the bottom, what this is telling us is the Wellcome Trust policy um, adopts, a variety, uh, adopts and extends a number of these other policies. We've got the OECD principle and guideline for access to research data from public funding, and we've got another Wellcome Trust policy here a joint statement of purpose. And these are all related to each other. Now, up here at the top, we've also got a, what's called a collects relationship. So what's happening here is that the National Child Development Study, a, a UK-based longitudinal study, has stated that it uses the Wellcome Trust uh, data policy. And when we go and visit this collection, this collection of resources and the standards and databases used by this National Child Development Study, you can get a whole picture of the landscape of the policies it's implementing, the databases it recommends to use, and the, and the data standards that within that particular study uh, the, the members are meant to use. 
this whole ecosystem of relationships among all standards, policies, and databases is really important for understanding the use and adoption of them. And what you get really with this is, is standards are really a pillar affair and the implementation of these standards and the display of the standards and the relationships among them really help enabling uh, the, the FAIR movement. And we have not, we have over 150 policies registered with FAIR sharing, but they have a whole variety of, of type and focus. And they cover all sorts of research areas. Now they can, some of our policies are broader or more specific. Some cover different types of digital objects, but they all have a variety of metadata fields which are relevant to their classification and to pulling particular types of policies out. You can slice our policies based on the organizations that develop them, the countries that they're related to, their discipline coverage or the content that they are describing, and also the relationships among them. Why do organizations use fair sharing for their policy registration? It helps make their policies more transparent. It allows them to list all their recommended resources and it allows them to keep abreast of the dynamic landscape of these resources, these standards and repositories. It allows them to monitor the evolution of those resources. I told you before, we have the ability to store the status of resources. So if a policy maker checks on their fair sharing record, they can find out if any of their resources they recommend are now deprecated or have had a, a, a status change that might mean they need to modify their policy. And that means they can evolve and update their policy through the recommendations and the, and the visibility and the information provided through their policy record and fair sharing. And what we offer them is citability through a DOI. We offer them, as I said before, the ability to monitor the landscape and find out well, who's the use and adoption of their policy by other resources. And it allows discoverability because we have a JSON export as well as the human readable form that you see on our screenshots today. We provide clear descriptions and metadata, relationships and in development comparing policies one to another. So I briefly mentioned JSON metadata. That's, this is a screenshot that we like to show to see how you can access our content and the ways in which we standardize that content and work with other resources to map our content to theirs. I'm not gonna go into detail. It's enough to see that there are a variety of ways of doing it. As a final slide, I just want to go a little bit into what we've learned as fair sharing as we've developed our policy registry and as policies themselves have changed a little bit in their scope and their coverage. What people want out of a policy really has changed. Um, so we, again, we provide registration of policies within fair sharing to provide discoverability of those policies, citability of those policies, and provide clear descriptive metadata that is accessible by machines and humans. Our relationships really give a powerful tool to monitor the adoption and the general landscape of all of these resources, not just the policies themselves. And the comparability of our resources in fair sharing is something that is on the horizon now that our brand new version of fair sharing came out uh, this no, last month. We can also prototype and implement uh, templates for policies. And this is really where uh, Joy and the work that she's doing with the checklist, it comes in because we got in touch, uh, Joy and I, to talk about the ways in which we can help each other uh, get machine accessible content that aligns with that fair is fair data policy checklist. And we can engage with our policy stakeholders. Uh, all of our policy records can be claimed and many of them are, by the people who make those policies themselves. And that gives us a working energetic community that, that, can, that can really give back in terms of feedback on things like implement, prototype implementations and templates. Now, in terms of lessons learned, there's always a cost when it comes to curation and maintaining the description and monitoring the evolution of these policies require continued engagement with the community and continued curation. And the community have a real reason to come to us and keep their resources up to date. But that is always, of course, um, a point that, that, that 
that is can be difficult in terms of long term maintainability. And can we actually converge towards a common system for a, and a common template for policymakers? We've got we've got the data policy checklist by Fair's Fair. There's there's the top guidelines. There's the RDA work. And so really coming in and aligning uh, it, all of that work to provide exactly the metadata that that users want within their policy record is, is, is really important and really exciting. And finally, curating, describing, and tagging the policies is not trivial. And these activities always need funding. Most repositories uh, work really hard to try to get funding for data curation and, and data quality. And that's the same with us. And we have a dedicated in-house curation team and we have our wonderful community of users to help us do that. But the, the, this is also one of those important points when we're thinking about uh, monitoring and curating and registering policy metadata. My final slide is simply a thank you to everyone who's been involved with fair sharing, our operational team, as well as our advisory board that includes both stakeholder advisors and executive advisors. Uh, I have not had the chance to look at the chat or the Q&A yet because I have been talking and having my slides full screen. But in any case, I believe it's Joy's turn and then we can move on to, to any uh, questions. Yeah, there, there is actually one question um, just before we go on and it's asking if there are certain prerequisites that need to be fulfilled in order to register a policy on fair sharing. The only, really the only prerequisite we have is that it's a data policy rather than a policy that doesn't concern open uh, you know, access to data. Does that make sense? But you can go today and register your policy. The, I, I believe in theory, in terms of programmatic requirements, it's simply that you have to have a name and a URL and, and, a, dis, and a short description. And I should also point out, it isn't actually just data policies. We do offer some other different types like software policies. Hey, thank, thank you very you. much. I don't see any more hands up. So I think, um, so thank you very much, Alison, for that. Um, it's now over to Joy. So Joy Davidson, who's known to most of us, I think she's the coordinator at Digital Curation Centre and work package leader um, for the Fair as Fair um, project. Um, over to you, Joy, to talk about the data policy checklist that's great. Thanks very much, Vanessa. Um, I think ours is going to be quite um, a very short and practical kind of a, a discussion about some of the work that we've been doing in Fair's Fair uh, that touches on a lot of the points we've already heard about today. So just a kind of reminder, um, as we've seen through the previous discussions, a lot of people are active in this area. So it's not just looking to monitor EOSC readiness, you know, the EOSC Association um, and the EOSC portal that are sharing this information, but we have existing um, descriptions such as the Open Air um, uh, Observatory as well. And uh, they also provide country level descriptions for open science policies. So it is quite an active landscape and there's lots of people looking to get information on different aspects. Of, of open science policies and data policies. So it's important to kind of bear that in mind. Um, and I think Volker mentioned it is a very crowded landscape as well. One of the things we've noticed, um, we did some landscaping activity ourselves in Fair's Fair way back in 2019. And we did use a lot of these resources. So the uh, open uh, air resources and the Spark Europe and DCC uh, policy reports and a number of other uh, landscape assessments to try and get a sense of what the policy and landscape was in, in 2019. Um, what we found was that most of these portals provide a, a narrative description, you know, a very rich description of the policy landscape, and it's very useful. Um, it's primarily at the, the national level, but increasingly we're starting to see people report on uh, specific institutional efforts within uh, some of these descriptions as well. But ultimately, what we found was it was very, very hard to compare the content of the policies. So going back to uh, what Justina mentioned uh, at the very start, um, one of the things they're looking to, to monitor is something to do with data sharing in policies and data management plans. So again, these kinds of aspects can be very hard to pull out from some of these portal descriptions currently. Um, so there's a lot of manual 
reading through and trying to, to get a sense of what the different policies are requiring and you know, what's covered. Um, and I think you know, going back to the TRIA, there is this kind of aim to move towards a more standardized approach to being able to monitor the landscape. And you know, we take that to meaning not just that there is uh, an open science or a data policy in place, but importantly, it's going to be um, necessary that we can understand what's covered within those policies as well. So as Alison mentioned, uh, we've been working in, in Fair is Fair to come up with something called a, a fair data policy checklist. Uh, this has come out of some work that we've done um, to support a cohort of policymakers who, who responded to an open call that we put out a, about a year ago. Um, we've got 20 policymakers, uh, most at the institutional level, some at the national funding level and some at the national sort of initiative level who've been working with us and um, we've been working to try and look at their policies and to help them align with some uh, recommendations that we had put out on how to become more fair enabling. So to allow us to do that uh, comparison of the policies and to see how they reflect uh, the recommendations that we put out, um, we came up with some instruments internally for the reviewers in Fair is Fair who are involved in looking at the policies and we broke down uh, the policies into very distinct elements. So things like, does it require uh, data sharing? Is there a reference to software sharing? Um, is metadata sharing expected and, and so on? We came up with about just under 40 of these elements. Some were to do with the uh, context of the policy. Uh, some most were to do with the actual content of the policy and some were to do with uh, the support for the policy. So many of the elements I think reflect very well on what we heard from uh, Justina's talk earlier. Um, so we came up with this approach and used that to provide consistency in the reviews that we were giving to the policymakers. Um, but what we wanted to then do was to translate that instrument into something publicly available for people who weren't part of our support cohort. Support cohort. Uh, so this is something that we've been working on recently, um, the Fair Data Policy Checklist, um, and you can see a screenshot here. Um, we've translated that tool into something that can be used independently by any policymaker who just wants to review their policy and to see how fair enabling uh, it currently is. So they work through the elements. Um, they choose the option on the right hand side of the of the screen, and that gives them a sense of uh, you know what their policy currently does or does not cover. In the middle column, we've got some general practice uh, recommendations that uh, we would uh, recommend to people. So this is a tool that we would recommend people to use as sort of um, assessing self assessing the content of their policies to see how fair enabling it is. So we have been using that. As I said, the uh, draft is out for public comment. It actually has just closed um, earlier this week. So we'll be addressing the comment this, that we've received. But based on that bit of work, we then came up with something that once you've got your policy and, and you're happy with it, um, what we want to encourage people to do is to then um, create a structured description of the policy content. And based on that fair data policy checklist, we've come up with uh, a policy characterization template. And it's just a simple spreadsheet uh, document. Um, it's using a lot of controlled text, so it shouldn't take a lot of effort to fill in, but um, each of the policy elements um, included in the fair data checklist are included in this characterization template. So we will be, again, it's a, it's a draft at the moment. We will be uploading a version of this to Zenodo so people can download it and make use of it. But the idea is essentially that you would then um, work through each of the uh, policy elements in this middle column here. And in most cases, it's a drop down box. And you would simply um, click the, the option that best reflects the um, content of your policy. So for example, here, data sharing, um, you would then tick whether it's suggested in your policy, whether it's required, or whether your policy doesn't cover data sharing. Um, we've included the option to include other for all of the options, just because you know sometimes there's uh, something in between and there is an option I haven't included on, on the screen here just for space, but we have a column to allow people to add notes uh, if they choose other. And we've also included a column for people to copy and paste the relevant piece of text from the policy uh, to, to map to the, uh, the policy element. So it's a fairly simple approach to creating a structured policy uh, description. 
and what I'll spend the next couple of minutes telling you now is a, a suggested workflow that we uh, would encourage people who do want to come up with a structured view of their policy, how they might then go about making this uh, visible and usable. Um, it was important for us to try and use existing infrastructure where it was uh, already there. So what I'll be doing is kind of showing a little bit on how we would envisage using uh, fair sharing, which is what you just heard from Allison. So first and foremost, we would encourage people to uh, upload their structured description to either their institutional repository or a service like Zenodo so that it's uh, deposited with a uh, repository. We would also encourage people to include a policy document um, in Zenodo or their institutional repository as well. Um, and then to make sure both have a DOI and that these are linked to each other. So we think that this is uh, you know, a really important step not just for the structured policy, policy description, but having your policy document in a repository is good practice as well, just for transparency. Uh, because again, if you've got a website page with a policy, that can change over time and it can be very hard to see versions of policies over time. So we think it's a good idea to have both the policy document and the structured description uh, deposited with a repository. So we are working on a draft guide that will we'll share this workflow as well. So we will share that um, with the, everyone later. So the next step, once you have your DOIs for both uh, the structured version of your policy and your policy document, um, we would then recommend that you create a, a record in fair sharing for your policy uh, so that you get that standard metadata description that is something that can be maintained and updated over time and then Within the fair sharing, um, when you're adding your, your record, you have the, op the potential to record related um, uh, policies and other documents. And, and I think Allison gave you that nice demonstration of how you can show the links between them. So in your fair sharing record, we would include uh, both the link to your policy documents with the DOI and also to your structured policy description with its DOI. And just a, a tip, we would always say that if you're putting something into fair sharing, it's a good idea to use the umbrella DOI so that you can kind of keep that uh, and it can be uh, still relevant if you update over time and get different versions of, of DOIs over time. Using the umbrella DOI will keep it up to date consistently. So once you've done that, the next step would be to make sure that you embed a link back to the fair sharing uh, record from your policy webpage. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we would encourage people to do. Um, quite often we'll see things in fair sharing where policies are regis registered, but it's not always that you're seeing that pointer to it from the organizational webpage or the funder webpage or, or whoever's policy it is. So I think it's good to make sure that you're including that pointer back to the record from your policy webpage and uh, along with the description of what you will actually get by going to the record. So the whole point of, of this approach is that you then have lots of ways for people to find information about your policy. They can either find it through Zenodo, they can find it through your webpage, or they can find it through fair sharing. Um, the important thing is that you've got then a citable version of your policy, as Allison mentioned, uh, fair sharing gives you a, a recommended way to cite it, as does Zenodo and most other repositories. And importantly, it's, it's helping us to move to making it findable by people, but also by machines. And I think as uh, we heard with Gareth's uh, presentation, machine actionability is something that we want to, to try and promote and to try and make the landscape monitoring a little bit more um, automated and less burdensome on, on the policymakers. So a couple of points here on just what we think the benefits of this approach are. Um, it means that the policies themselves are fair. So we are able to find them, access them, um, interoperate with them and reuse them uh, when we want to. Importantly for us, I think, you know, we've seen there's a lot of portals already. There's lots of um, annual surveys trying to get these snapshots uh, at a given point in time. One of the benefits of this approach is that you can update your policy anytime there's a change. You, you don't need to wait for the annual survey. You don't need to um, request a change to your record in one of the observatories or uh, other places, um, you're in control of how often you update it and you can make as many changes as you want over time. 
The other thing is that it's using freely available uh, repositories and registries. So there's no need to spend any money on this. It's just a little bit of time needed to do the work. So we think in that respect, it's very feasible. And again, it kind of takes away any dependencies on funded projects to maintain access to this over time. Uh, it just means that people can point to uh, this resource and anybody who's interested, whether it's the EOSC Association or people like Spark Europe and the DCC, Open Air or EOSC Future, uh, it means that we can then point to this uh, structured and comparable view of the policy and it's something that's there over time. A couple of things that we see as future opportunities. So as uh, Allison mentioned, Fair Sharing is currently working on updating their metadata. So uh, there is potential to include more of these kind of structured descriptions in Fair Sharing, which would really um, lend itself well to supporting that sort of machine readability of uh, structured policy content. So we do see potential for this uh, moving forward. And that would support this sort of more automated landscape monitoring and take a little bit less um, time and effort for the policymakers in terms of having to report. So that is a run through of how we are um, considering doing this. It's, it's very exploratory for Fair is Fair. It certainly is just a, a small part of a, a work we're doing with our uh, policy support cohort. So the feasibility, we'd love to hear from other people if this does seem like it's something that would be useful and if other people would like to get involved. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joy. Are there any questions to Joy? I see that there's a request in the chat for the URL of the, the policy checklist. Yep, um, they are both in the slides, which will be up on the website later today. Just a reminder that these are both drafts at the moment. We had the policy checklist out for public comments. That period has closed. Um, if anybody has any real urgent comments that you want to share with me, I'd, I'd be happy to take them though. So there are details again on that slide as to how to do that. So I'll share that later today. Thank you. So thank you to everybody who stuck with us uh, through almost to the end of a uh, two hour session. We still have some time for questions, either to the individual speakers or to all. Um, is there anybody who would like to raise a question at this point from the audience, the broader audience, either in the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll give you the mic. It's very quiet. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just want, I'm I'm wondering, um, um so we've we've heard extensively um how EOSC uh, is intending um on um, monitoring policies and also uh, using that to stimulate the progression towards uh the EOSC that we are all looking forward to um and we've heard about uh, some of these great um tools machine readability uh, having having improved access to the the, the source of that policy, to, um, reliable um, uh, access to the the policies, um, but who else might want to monitor policy? So I think we saw that with Gareth, we had that like ring, the fourth ring. Um, Joy, you already mentioned uh, some others who are monitoring policies. So apart from EOSC and the importance. Uh, for EOSC, um, who else um, could benefit from EOSC Future uh, or from some of the other work that we're doing and we're going to be collecting the data from? Um, I think also, um, Alison, you touched on this, but um, why is policy monitoring so important and who else could benefit from some of the things that we heard about today beyond uh, EOSC. May I mention something briefly? Yes, please do. Yes. I won't take long, so if others want to answer too. Um, I just wanted to say that, yes, you're right, I did touch on this briefly, but with the 10-minute version of the presentation, I don't go into too much detail with our stakeholders, 
But yes, there are a lot of people who find beyond beyond EOSC itself, there are a lot of people who find the policies in fair sharing, which is of course the information I know most about, very useful. We have the people who come to us as consumers of fair sharing who, who want to find resources. So they're looking for databases or standards to use. They might have to conform to a particular policy. So they might be told because of their funding situation or because of another society or organization they belong to, they have to conform to a policy. So they can find that policy in fair sharing and provide it provides them the list of resources that they should use or sometimes are required to use in order to conform. And so we get we get not just the um, the policymakers themselves coming and finding it interesting to see what other policies are around and what might implement similar standards and databases to help inform their own policy making but also the researchers who have to abide by those policies, the societies and communities who might be developing their own, and also data stewards and data management uh, experts who are trying to formulate their own maybe institutional policies and want to see what else is out there. So there's a lot of different people that come and all of them have some engagement on some level with policies. So I think it's, it's quite a broad field. Uh, that's, that's my answer anyway. <laughs> Indeed, thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I can support. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Gareth. No, no. Go yeah, ahead, go ahead. I think no. huh, it was close. Okay. I'll just very quickly. I, I mean, Vanessa and I have been doing through Spark Europe and DCC a series of policy landscape updates every six months. Um, you know, so we've been trying to, to look at the evolution. So it's, you know, in some ways it's the history of open science and different countries' approaches to it. So, you know, that that's something I think is still of interest as well, is just how things are evolving in that respect. Thank you. Gareth. Yeah, I, I always wonder like to what extent, because we're talking always about research and, and typically the researchers fall out of the picture. And I always wonder to what extent they really are interested in the policies. But I, I do agree with Alison that maybe they're not interested in many or most of those policies but some of them are very particular and i think they would be interested like open access policies or fair data management policies uh, you know whether that's in their country or at a european level but it would be nice to, to be able to find those policies you know easy and to see how it looks across uh, institutions or countries and so forth uh, and i mean i'm thinking of the likes of plan s where you know plan s had a set of um, um, requirements and restrictions and so forth for researchers falling under that policy. And I think one of the very useful tools that came out was the Plan S journal checker, where the policy mm -hmm. was actually implemented directly into something usable, where a researcher can go to a website uh, and, and go check for journals that fit their requirements and that they can, you know, quicker find journals uh, where they can actually be Plan S compliant. So that, that was an example, let's say, of a policy relevant for researchers where just giving them the, the document of all the rules probably wasn't going to help them much, but then translated into a tool, which was very, very quick, easy, uh, and useful for researchers to use, you know? Thanks. Do we have any movement in the audience? Any more questions? No, I don't. I think everything's been addressed so far. So I think we're five minutes left and- uh... Yes, okay, well, five minutes. So I think it, I'm, I'm thrilled to um, wrap this uh, session up. Um, we've had almost two hours. I think what we're really seeing um, is that um, open science policy making is really stepping up a gear. Um, so you look at how important it is to, um, understand the policies that are out there, to have access to them, to also uh, look into how effective those policies are and what do we really need to monitor, to uh, translate that into success for EOSC. Um, we've got some uh, great initiatives, tools, uh, fair sharing was talked about, the fair is fair um, work, the, the, the checklist, uh, we've been hearing throughout, actually, I think almost everybody was talking about this new normal. So this is the policies and these tools are really enabler, enablers for that new normal or to make, you know, open the default, if you like. Um, it's really essential that we have reliable data. And I think many of us are really speaking to the policymakers um, 
So we need to hold some of those hands and provide them guidance on where they can simply store that data and we point to it effectively and use it in our bigger systems like uh, EOS Future. Um, I think it's really exciting to hear about all of those plans, looking at the monitoring framework house from the EOS partnership, um, looking at those the, the essential elements um, and also, also the work, the survey for the EOS steering board. There's going to be plenty of really interesting data and EOS futures will help uh, translate that into a language that makes sense to many of us through better visualizations. Looking forward to that going forward. Um, yes, and um, I think we're looking forward to seeing what comes out from the EOS partnership uh, survey work and, and also from the EOS, EOS steering board um, and to see how uh, open science um, policy making and implementation is progressing over time. Um, so I think we've heard, uh, we've heard from some great examples, great initiatives. I think we're starting to have some great conversations about this. There are other players in this space and open science policy making goes beyond EOSC, but EOSC is a very important part of that. Um, so let's continue having that conversation. Let's make sure we work together. And that's what I love about the EOS Futures as well. It's really looking at the landscape. How can we bring this together, collaborate together? That's what's really key. But let's then decide together what's most effective. Um, what do we monitor? How do we monitor so that it's less of a painful lift for our policymakers? Um, so I think that's how I'd like to end, really. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, it has been recorded, so uh, do share it with your colleagues um, when it's made available. Is it going to be made available on the Fair as Fair website, which is still continuing? Yeah. Um, yes. So thank you again um, to uh, Joy Davidson for conceptualizing the event, for all of our speakers for coming, um, and to, uh, to Trust IT. Uh, beavering away in the background, supporting us with the, the technology. Um, and thank you all for your time, two hours talking about policy over lunchtime. Nota bene. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thanks, 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 Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.